Good morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the Kingdom of Grace Ministries. Amen. And all of you who attended yesterday, the 16th annual Pastors and Wife Prayer Breakfast Anniversary Appreciation, we thank you. It was a success. Amen. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Welcome to the Kingdom of Grace Ministries. Amen. Uh, today we'll be talking about fighting an unseen enemy, the predator. The predator. An unseen enemy. Amen. I'm pretty sure y'all seen the movie with one of my favorite movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger called The Predator. Amen. He always operated in stealth. You couldn't see him. But if you had spiritual uh, discernment, you could see a silhouette of his movement. Amen. That's why spiritual discernment is so important. Amen. Because we're not ignorant of his devices. Amen. The predator operates in stealth. Amen. Let's look at Ephesians, the sixth chapter. We're going to read verses 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. May God's blessing be upon the reading of the word. Amen. You may be seated. Fighting an unseen enemy, the predator. The predator operates in stealth. You can't see him. Amen. Number two. If you were a threat, then he set out to kill you. If you ever saw the movie The Predator, anybody that had a weapon that he thought was a threat, he went after them to kill them. But if they did not have a weapon and they were not a threat, he just overlooked them because you, you're not a threat to me. Another thing I noticed about the movie The Predator is that when Arnold Schwarzenegger was covered in mud, he couldn't see him. Think about that. If he was covered, he could not see him. So we as Christians, if we are covered in the blood, then there's a hiding place in God to where the enemy cannot see you. Amen. The Bible says he will hide you in the cleft of the rock. There's a hiding place in God. Amen. Now, the small battles that we face are part of a much more bigger war. Understanding where we fit in God's cosmic strategy will help us to take our individual assignments more seriously. Because the moment that we were born, we were immediately dropped into a war zone and it's ground zero. Amen. We're in a war zone. It's a war for our soul. Amen. Now, God has given us biblical principles concerning spiritual warfare that are both doctrinally sound and practical. In other words, they are founded on God's word, and there's life application. In other words, anything God asks us to do is doable. He will not ask you to do nothing that you can't do. Amen. Now, when the angels, when the fallen angels that rebelled against God 
were cast out of heaven, they lost their intimate connection with God, as well as their place in the atmosphere of his glory. So the intimate connection that they had with God, when they failed, they severed that relationship. And the atmosphere of his glory is a place that they dwell. The atmosphere is a particular environment or surrounding influence. It's the environment that sustains life. In other words, as long as they were in the atmosphere of God's glory, they had to operate a certain way. Amen. A fish has to be in water. That's his environment. The environment of a Christian is an environment of prayer. We must have a lifestyle of prayer. That creates the atmosphere that's conducive for God to dwell. The Bible says he inhabits the praise of his people. When we praise God, when we operate in prayer, we operate in, a, in an environment, in an uh, atmosphere that's conducive for God to move. Amen. Now, there are major consequences. I'm sorry, there are two major consequences to the fall. We're talking about Satan. We're talking about the strategy. We're talking about the spiritual warfare. Number one, perversion of their original attributes. Remember, they operated in an atmosphere of glory. But when they fell, their original attributes were perverted. They're no longer angels. They're fallen angels. They're demons now. They pervert everything that God ordained. They pervert sex. They pervert everything. Everything that God said was good, they pervert it. They change it. Number two, without the atmosphere of glory for which they were made, they needed another environment in which to express themselves and fight against God. They needed a human agency to work through because God created humans to rule and take care of the earth. So when these demons fell, since they were no longer in the environment that God created them to be in, which was the environment of glory, they were perverted because they were separated from God. So in order to carry out their perversions, they need a human host to operate through. See, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling, we're fighting an unseen enemy. The new environment is the earth. They were cast to the earth. They needed a human agency to work through because God created humans to rule and take care of the earth. So in order for demons to upset the authority that God gave man, they must create a partnership with humans as hosts for their missions against God. Amen. Stay with me. Now, there's always a correspondence with what you see going on in the natural with what is transpiring in the spiritual realm. What we call spiritual warfare is the conflict in the spiritual realm that affects the physical realm. Now, this is the spiritual battle in the heavenlies. Number one, the spiritual battle takes place in the heavenlies. Number one, to obstruct our blessings from coming from heaven. Remember, remember Daniel, prayed 20, Daniel prayed 21 days, but God said, I heard you the first time you prayed. So the first strategy is in the heavenly realm because Satan operates in the atmosphere. Amen. So it's a spiritual battle in the heavenlies to obstruct our blessings from coming down from heaven. Number two is interference with our communication to heaven. In other words, our prayers getting through. That's why we get frustrated when we pray. Number three, to discourage us from praying. Now, that's the first one. The first one is the spiritual battle in the heavenlies that obstructs us from getting to God. Number two, there's the worldly battle that wants us to conform to the world. So we got the world that's pulling against us. We got the heavenly battle that's going on. 
to where we're trying to get a prayer through, but then there's this distortion, this distraction in the atmosphere. Then there's the worldly battle that wants to get us to conform to the world. That's why prayer is so vitally important. Amen. Prayer is our weapon. It's the weapon of our warfare, not carnal. See, they are spiritual weapons. And the most powerful weapon that we have in our arsenal is prayer. Now, I gave an illustration one time that corporate prayer is so vital to the Christian. We can pray by ourselves. But a lot of times, if you're praying by yourself, it's like using an, uh, uh, an extension cord. You plug in that extension cord, right? And sometimes the wires are frayed on that cord. And it's distortion. So usually when it's distortion, it's not on God's end. It's on our end. So a lot of times we have things going on in our life. And it's hard to get through when we're praying. Because remember I said that it's a spiritual battle and it's in the atmosphere. Satan is trying to stop our prayers from getting through. But if you have a power strip and you plug into that power strip, that power strip is, is designed to hold a whole lot of uh, power, electrical current. So everybody that plugs into that power strip is, a, is available or they have access to everything that's flowing through there. That's where corporate prayer is so important. So you can pray by yourself, but a lot of times the, 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 the power that God wants to send you, the power search he wants to send you, your little extension cord ain't going to hold it. You need a power strip. You got to connect with other people that are on the same wavelength, that are connected to God. So everything that's flowing through that power strip, once you plug in, you're connected to it also. So Satan desires to divide us. He wants to divide and conquer. If he can get me fighting my little battle over here and get you fighting your little battle over there and get you fighting your little battle over there, okay, he has the upper hand. But when we come together, when we unite, when we pray, when there's corporate prayer, when we pray for one another, then when, where, there's, where there's unity, there's strength. The Bible says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity because that's where I command the blessing. Now, we're talking about fighting an unseen enemy, the predator. So, how does he come against us? He comes against us through temptation. Look at Matthew 26 and 41. Matthew 26 and 41. Amen. Matthew 26 and 41. And it says, It says, Watch and pray. That you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So how do you win the battle with temptation? Temptation is, in general, is anything that has the force or ability to seduce and draw our hearts and minds from the obedience that God requires of us. Anything that causes or occasions us to sin or neglect our duty to God, either by bringing evil into our heart or by drawing out the evil that is already in there. That's temptation. It either draws you to do something that's against God's will or it pulls on you, it pulls something out of you that's already in there. See, Satan's not going to tell me to rob a bank because he know I'm not going to do that. But he know what I like. He know what you like. And when he comes against us, he comes to draw out. And see, that the Bible says that in the last days, the spirit, the, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The spirit of the Antichrist is already prevalent. And what he's doing, he's drawing things to the surface. If it's righteousness in you, it's going to show up. If we got unconfessed, unrepentant sin, it's going to come to the surface. And you wonder why people acting like that. He's just drawing out like a magnet. Whatever's in us is pulling it to the surface. That's why people are getting more violent. You know, debauchery, no control over nothing, no barriers, no boundaries, because he's, it's a spirit. It's a, I call it the climate of the age. It's, it's, it's a spirit in the atmosphere that's drawing things out of people. Amen. 
So it's going to draw out because Satan continues to operate in the world and our own desires remain, we will be tempted. So temptation is something you can't get away from because we are imperfect being beings living in an imperfect environment that's contaminated by sin, period. So God did not promise to keep us from temptations. Matthew 6 and 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of Amen. So, lead us not into temptation. It is possible to be tempted and yet not enter into temptation. So, temptation is not sin. But when we enter into temptation, it's sin. So it's possible to be, t be tempted and not enter. Just because you're having all these feelings and all this stuff is going on inside of you don't mean that you've committed a sin. It's once you yield to it. See, you can have all kinds. You can have bad dreams. You can have all sorts of feelings, all sorts of emotions, and you'll be feeling guilty that you committed a sin. You'll have all sorts of thoughts in your mind, and nobody knows but you and God. But unless you yield to that, you have not sinned yet. Amen. Now, if you allow it to, to, to resonate in your spirit and you dwell on it all day, now you're becoming an incubator for sin. Sooner, sooner or later, it's going to develop into something. Amen. So, entering into temptation is not to be conquered by it or fall down under it by committing the sin or evil that tempts us. We can enter into temptation and not fall under temptation. Because God will make a way of escape. You can enter into it and not be overtaken by it. Because God will perform a, a provide a ways of escape. Jesus entered into temptation, but he was not overcome by it. He was tempted, but he, he was not overcome. Okay, 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. I'm going to read that right quick. 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. It says, uh, let's see, 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So falling into temptation is like falling into a pit and being entangled by snares. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, it says to be taken by temptation is to be entangled with it and held by it with what seems to be no means of escape. 2 Peter 2 and 9, God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. God knows how to set us free. When we allow temptation to enter into us, then we enter into the temptation. So when you allow the temptation to overtake you, now you're entering into, into it. Because it's always a method to it. It's always step A, step B, and step C. And if you see the pattern, and you know that if you do this, you're going to end up doing that. And if you do that, you're going to end up doing that. Then you see the pattern. So you got to say, wait a minute, I'm not going that direction. Amen. You got to make a, a conscious decision that you're going to do right just because it's the right thing to do. So uh, Satan lures us into temptation to sin by fear. He can create fear, make you just panic and just feel that you just you got to do something. You can get a bad report from the doctor. Anything can happen. He can create fear. Allurements. He can allure you. Persecutions. You know, people can threaten you. Seductions. You can be seduced. He will enhance and intensify desires of lust for something either within us or outside of us. In other words, lust will come to a head. He'll intensify it. You know, if you're lonely, he'll intensify your need for someone. He'll intensify it to where you have to respond, you have to act on it. So once the heart becomes entangled with temptation to this degree, 
it will justify its pursuit of its desires. So once, once, it, once it comes to a head and you don't check it, then you're going to justify why you're doing what you're doing because it's got to that point now. Amen. It's gotten to a boiling point. So you got to check temptation before it gets to the point of, I call it the point of no return. Amen. See, the Bible say the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Am I right? So the spirit wants to do right. But once the flesh gets stimulated, that's the point of no return. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Once the, the flesh got a mind of its own, once the flesh gets stimulated, all reasoning go out the window. Oh, I might get pregnant. Oh, we'll worry about that later. I ain't thinking about that right now. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Amen. We ain't worrying about that. Oh, what if mama still? Oh, mama still asleep. Don't worry about it. We're here when she get out the bed. We hear the bed creak. Okay. Now, once the heart becomes entangled with temptation to this desire, this degree, it will justify. How many times have we justified stuff? Amen. Once, once, once that genie get out the bottle, he ain't going back in there. I don't care how much you pray. I rebuke you. Now, you need to rebuke yourself right now. Okay, Revelation 3 and 10. There, okay, let me read this. Revelation 3 and 10. Amen. Revelation 3 and 10. It says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep them from keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on earth. So there's an hour of temptation, which is the season where it grows to a head. So Satan has strategies against all of us, and there's an hour that we're gonna face of temptation. Every last one of us, it's an hour. I don't know when your hour is. I don't know when mine is. It's going to be an hour where it's going to come to a head, and it's going to be very heated, and it's going to be very strong. Amen. And we're going to have to deal with it. It says, when the hour of temptation has come upon us, in other words, we have entered into it. It's a battle now. We're talking about spiritual warfare. Now it's a battle. And the strongest battle that we have is the battle with our flesh. It's the battle inside of us. See, it's the private battles, the inner struggles. All of the issues that we're dealing with, that nobody knows about but us and God. It ain't the devil. It's the stuff that's going on inside of us. That's the hour of temptation. Amen. And it's real. Every great and pressing temptation has its hour. A season where it grows to a head, becoming more vigorous, more active, and more prevalent. Temptation has a season where it has a dangerous hour. It's going to get vigorous, active, and prevalent. It's going to be a dangerous hour. Amen. Because temptation is designed to make us fall, and we all face it. How the hour of temptation comes. The hour of temptation first comes by repeated advances to cause your mind to rationalize giving in to it. The devil going to keep coming. He going to keep coming. He going to wear you down. He going to keep coming to get you to justify or to rationalize. There is a need of breaking bondage in our individual lives, and from there, the ability to pray for someone else in the same capacity. So how can you pray for somebody else when you're struggling? Unconfessed sin, and, and the Bible calls it iniquities. That's the stuff that we know about that nobody knows about but us and God. And maybe the person you, you're doing it with. Or you're doing it by yourself. But nobody knows but you and God. So unconfessed sin it's like a broken wire from the source of power. Remember I mentioned extension cord? You're trying to plug in to God, but you got a broken wire. 
it's frayed, it's sparking. So when you get distortion and you don't get the power surge that you need to get delivered, it's not a distortion on God's end, it's on your end. Your wise broke. You got some in your life that needs to be fixed. That's why we need corporate prayer. We need to plug in. Amen. Prayer is the most powerful weapon, and it's the most neglected weapon that we use as Christians. There must be humility on our part. James 4, 6 through 8. Amen. James 4, 6 through 8. Amen. James 4, 6 through 8. It says, but he giveth more grace. Wherewith he said, God resists the proud, but give it grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So the Bible says, draw nigh to God. In other words, you need to go to where God is. But we're trying to bring God to where we are. No, we, get to, we need to get to where God is. Our power comes from submitting to God. The level of our submission to God is our level of resistance to Satan. The more you get, the more you resist, the more you submit to God, the stronger you get in resistance to Satan. Then you wonder when you fall. Just think about it. When did you fall? Were you praying? Now, it's usually when we quit praying, we quit doing what we're supposed to do, we quit coming to church, we start attaching ourselves more to the people of the world. Then we find out we start slipping. We start backsliding. We start going back to our old habits and old ways. It's a pattern to it. You quit praying. You quit seeking God. Now you're back doing what you used to do. Amen. The level of our submission to God is the level of our resistance to Satan. It is the power of God that destroys the devil's influence. Humility is first. Open honesty is second. Third, there must be confession of the issues that we are struggling with. First of all, we got to, be, we got to have humility and, and, and acknowledge that we need help. Second, we got to be honest. If it's something that God telling us to stop doing, we just got to be honest. I don't want to stop because I like what I'm doing. It's wrong. I feel bad about it. I feel guilty about it. I know it's wrong, but I, I don't want to quit because I like it. Amen. You just got to be honest. Lord, help me because if I continue to do this, it's going it's to sever my relationship with you, and I might miss heaven. And I don't want to miss heaven over no foolishness. It ain't worth it. Amen. Like Sister Daisy said, every road got to end. Every road you drive down, it got to end somewhere. Every road going to end somewhere. Where's yours going to end? Where's mine going to end? Amen. Where's it going to end? But the Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. We need a cleansing. The Bible says in Romans 6 and 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. We don't have to be a slave to sin, and we don't have to yield to temptation. David prayed, order my steps in your word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. When our steps are ordered by the Lord, and his word is a part of our very beings, we are invested with power and authority. You don't have to let thoughts suggestions or images resonate in your spirit. The Holy Ghost has given us power to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We can stand on the promises of God's word because God's word is based on the integrity of his character. God cannot lie. He will not lie. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. All those that call upon me, I will in no wise cast out. We must have an unwavering faith in the word of God. Unwavering faith. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our faith must not waver. Don't you know the quality of your faith creates the platform for God to move? 
You got a shaky faith. God can't move on a shaky foundation. What's the quality of your faith? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Without a dynamic faith nourished by God's word and embedded in our hearts, we will not successfully battle the advances of Satan. Satan going to keep coming. Amen. Not just when you first get saved. The longer you've been saved, the more he's, he steps up his advances. Amen. Amen. He attacks me harder. Amen. He attacks me with depression, all sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff. Stuff I used to deal with years ago and come back and knock on my door. Yeah, what you want? You better send Jesus to the door. Yeah, what you want? You better, you better send Jesus to the door to answer the door for you. Amen. That thing going to come back. You thought you got rid of it. You thought you conquered it. Amen. It'll rise up 30 years from 30 years later to rise up and knock on your door. Where this come from? Praise the Lord. That's the truth. The Holy Spirit has given us power to bring every thought captive to obedience of Christ. Praise the Lord. Without a dynamic faith that's nourished by God's word and embedded in our hearts, we will not successfully battle the advances of Satan. When challenged by temptation, our faith must constantly come into focus. What comes into focus when you're challenged? Your faith, your faith in God, your belief in God. See, you must, you must not only have faith, you must believe. Because the Bible says faith without works is dead. I'm going to tell you a little short story before I close. It was a man that was on a tight wire, and he had a long pole, and he was walking across the tight wire. He walked from one end to the other. He's about 35 feet or 50 feet up in the air. Everybody just clapping. Then he came back. He got his little son, put his son on his shoulders, around his neck, son holding him around his neck. He walked back, walked back forth with his son on there. So then he took his son off. He hollered at the crowd. The crowd just screaming, y'all saw what I did? Yeah, we saw what you did. Y'all believe I can do it again? Yeah, we believe you can do it again. You saw me do it with my son on my back, yeah? Yeah, we saw we. Okay, who's going to come up here and get on my back next? Nobody said nothing. See, I, 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 I believe you can do it. I seen you do it for somebody else. I don't know if you can do it for me. I believe because I've seen it, but I don't have faith to believe you can do it for me. And that's how we do. I've seen you do it for others. What Marvin wanted to say, I've seen you working in others, and I know you can work it in me. Whatever the song is. But y'all know, you know the song, I've seen you do it. Yeah, amen. If you can find that song, you can play it when we close. Amen. Now, prayer is a powerful weapon. The place of prayer is the council chamber where divine commands are issued. Remember I said we need to go to where God is instead of trying to bring God to where we are. God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. See, when we go to, when we go to where God is, Prayer is a powerful weapon. It's the place of prayer. It's the council chamber where divine commands are issued. So we're going into the chamber where decrees and commands are issued. We're going right before the judge. Amen. Remember I said prayer is a powerful weapon. Remember what happened with Job. The Bible says that Satan approached God for Job and said, you know what? I want to tap Job. I want to I want to I want to really mess him up, but I can't because you got a hedge around him. You know what that hedge was? That hedge was because Job was praying. The Bible says he prayed constantly for his family and for himself. And because he prayed, it was almost like an invisible force field that was around his property where Satan only he could only get so far. In other words, when you pray, God will put a restraining order on Satan. 
You can only get within 500 feet of his property, but you can, you can look over the fence, but you can't come. But guess what? God released it, right? He released the straining order, but he gave Satan visitation rights. You can come on the weekend, but you got to go at a certain time. You got visitation right. See, so what prayer does, if it does not put a restraining order on Satan, God will lift it just to test your faith. Yeah, he'll give him visitation right. He'll let him tap you, but he can't kill you. It's only to make you stronger. That's why we have to pray. But guess what? The Bible says Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. Remember I mentioned the predator? He's out there to, to destroy people that don't have right. So what happens? If you've been praying, you got a restraining, you got, you got a force field around your house, around your family. So when Satan passed by your house, can't go there, force field, restraining order, can't go. In other words, the council of heaven decreed a restraining order against me. Even though I want to go, I can't because they're praying. But when they get to the next house, no force field, no alarm system, he's going to go in. He going to sit down, he going to get your remote, he going to change the channel. He going to cross his feet and he going to take over your house. Why? Because you're not praying. No restraining order, no force field. Amen. That's why prayer is so powerful. When we stop praying, we allow Satan access to our families, to our minds, to our homes, to our children. Amen. The predator I love that movie. One thing about him, if you had spiritual discernment, it, it, was, it was a black man in the movie, and he always took his knife out. He gonna fight him with a knife. And when he, he, could, he could stare, nobody else could see him, but he could see a silhouette of his movement. See, God will give you spiritual discernment, and you will see a silhouette of the devil. There he is. You'll see his movement. You'll see his movement. And as long as you didn't have a weapon, you what? He walked right by you. But as soon as you had a weapon, he wanted to kill you. Why? Because you were a threat. See, when you got a weapon, you're a target for Satan. That's why so many things happen in our life, because we are a target, because we got weapons that we know how to use. Amen. If you don't have a weapon, he ain't worried about you. But one thing I, I noticed, when Arnold Schwarzenegger jumped off the cliff and he was covered in mud, he laying there. He said, I'm dead now. Predator walked by, couldn't even see him because he was covered in mud. He said, wait a minute. Can't you see me? That, that's why you got to be covered in the blood. Amen. See, the devil has a contract out on each and every one of us. He put a hit out just like the mafia. He has a contract out on us. Amen. But, but when you're covered in the blood, it cancels the assignment of the enemy. In other words, it cancels that contract. He can't do what he want to do. Amen. But he, uh, but he can tempt you. To get you to draw, to draw you away from God, but you don't have to yield to temptation. Amen. Let me read this one more time and I'm gonna close. Okay, prayer is a powerful weapon. The place of prayer is the council chamber where divine commands are issued. Amen. Divine decrees. See, uh, Heaven operates like a courtroom. You got the judge, which is God. You got the attorney that's sitting on his right hand that's, that's pleading for our case, which is Jesus Christ. And then you got, you got Satan, which is the prosecuting attorney that's coming in. Look what so-and-so did, judge. I got, I, got, I got some documented evidence that they did this. I know they're guilty. They're supposed to be your child. And then Jesus said, yeah, but guess what? I dropped all the charges. I'm going to give them a stay of execution, a reprieve. Not because they're not guilty, but because I paid the price. Amen. I paid the price for what they did. Amen. So, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I paid the price for what they did. So the place of prayer is the council chamber where divine commands are issued. 
In prayer, we receive the solution to our problems. A lot of times we, we, we are confused about which direction to go. We have question marks. And sometimes we just need clarity in terms of making decisions. That's where we receive the solution. In prayer, our strength is renewed. The Bible says those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Why? When you wait in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Why? Because we're in the presence. Remember I mentioned earlier about uh, angels were created to be in an environment of glory with the Lord. But when they, they sinned, they were cast out of that environment. So they're not in that environment. See, when you get in God's glory, then God puts an aura. He puts protection around you. It soothes you. It, cleans, it cleanses you. See, uh, the Bible says that God is light. Amen. What is light? Light is illumination. Light reveals what you don't see when it's dark. When you turn the light on, all of a sudden you see things you didn't see in the dark. See, what he does, when we get saved, he illuminates our minds. And all of a sudden we see things clearly. Now, I can see more clearly. Why? Because the rain is gone. The, cloud, the clouds are gone away. Right, the distortion is gone. I got a clear vision of where I'm going right now. So that's why it's so vitally important to serve God for real. Amen. To serve God for real. Because, saints, we're fighting an unseen enemy. It's the predator. And he's out to kill, to steal, and destroy. He's out to destroy marriages. He's out to take our youth out before they even grow up in unnecessary violence, uh, drugs, trafficking, uh, human trafficking, all sorts of things that's, that's going on in our society. Amen. So that's it for today. May God's blessing be upon the word. Ready to close and okay, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word today, God. Uh, we are fighting an unseen enemy, but the Bible says we're not ignorant of the devices of Satan. Heavenly Father, we realize that temptation is not sin, but yielding to temptation is sin. Lord, we are all tempted, uh, we are all under attack, Lord. There's a target on each and every one of us, Lord. Uh, our minds are being attacked. Our marriages are being attacked. Our families are being attacked. Our children, our grandchildren are being attacked. Lord, our finances are being attacked, Lord. It, it, it's just so much going on, Lord, and we need you to step in, Lord. We can't make it on our own, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would just continue to be with us, continue to comfort those, Lord, that are going through the bereaved families, Heavenly Father, Lord, I, uh, those that are dealing with issues right now, Lord, I pray that you would just bring closure even in the families right now. So many families are uh, disoriented. Just, just bring closure, Lord. And, Lord, we just thank you for the time together, Lord. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the throne of God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest, rule, and abide. Keep, protect us now henceforth and forevermore in jesus name we pray amen amen and amen god bless you and have a wonderful sunday afternoon amen